Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we bring you a special once a week material uh, when Alexei gives an interview in the format of Q&A to Vasil Galavanov at his podcast. This is uh, their joint podcast number 29. Today's stream is published under the title The Last Chance of United West is to Replay This War. Good questions, interesting insights, and it lasted for over an hour, so it will be split in two parts. And here is part one. Today's thanks go to Jamer and Zenny Gaming. Thank you, dear members, for continuing to support our channel, our work. This enables us to bring these materials to you and many others all across the world in English. And with this, let's deep dive into Galvanov stream number 29. Enjoy. Dear viewers, it's the 3rd of March today, and we have Alexei Aristovich with us live. Good evening, everybody. Did you fix or did you break your microphone there? We'll figure it out by the sound. Okay. Traditionally, to start with, my huge thanks to Defense Forces of Ukraine. We are really live, so please um, comment in the chat, in the comments under this video where you're watching us from. And do not forget to send your questions. Um, we will deliver them to Alexei, and uh, you might have a chance to get the answer live on the stream. We'll uh, start with the main events um, prevalent in the media today. And right before our stream, we learned that in Odessa, where Shahid hit uh, one of the multi-story apartment buildings, they found more bodies. Um, Alek and his uh, sister Zlata, 12 and 5 year old, and uh, the total number of victims is now 12. What can you say about this tragedy, Alexei? Um, there's nothing I can say here, really. Well, something that we would not be banned after. I did make a post that it feels like they took a part of each of us, because such a number of dead kids in one episode, in one hit of Shahid. When I see these faces of dead children, I somehow also see the non-delivered Taurus missiles from Germany, aid that has not arrived from the United States for a while, and our defenses near Avdivka that were not dug. Don't even know why. What about United States aid? Do you think uh, there is any good perspective there? Recently, General Milley made a statement that if the Congress will not vote for additional aid, then the front might collapse and Ukraine might likely lose this war. This is uh, quite true. If America will stop supporting us and will not send us any more military aid, we will not be able to hold it, because we will just run out of tools and shells and bullets to defend ourselves with. Not because we're not brave, or we'll be holding as long as we can, but the United States is still the main donor in the volume of uh, military support. Not a single country can compare with the United States in terms of delivered military aid to Ukraine. Europe is overtaking the leadership in monetary support now, but the uh, United States was still, so far, was the biggest supporter of uh, our military. and. Um, Unfortunately, they have not sent anything for over two months already. So, statements by Scholz from Germany that we will not be giving Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Then Simonian, Russian propagandist, publishes supposedly conversation of German military. What do you think about, and nobody argued that it is not real. So what do you think about the Taurus uh, missiles not being sent to Ukraine? We see the whole cascade of apologies from Scholz. For five days he's been apologizing, and this happens in parallel with uh, the France's statement that they may actually bring their troops into Ukraine. And for me, again, this is my work hypothesis, it's not a definite knowledge, it's more of a theory, that Europeans are realizing that Russians are going to attack Europe one way or another, and it led to two specific reactions. And given that the United States are rather far and uh, 
they're not really helping Ukraine at the moment, and nobody knows how much they will be helping Europe. So Europe is breaking apart into two camps. One of them is saying, let's not escalate. And the others are saying, well, sure, bring it on and we'll stop them in Ukraine before they come to Europe. So roughly German and French versions. What was interesting for me, when France brought this up, the, their troops into Ukraine as a topic, Canada, Estonia, and some other countries supported them. But what was interesting to hear also that there will be no Polish soldiers in Ukraine. Um, given that they're the next in line and they would be interested, one would think, but they have their own story. And uh, Michal Tkach published very interesting numbers. And his uh, publication, so Ukra Ukraine Pravda recently released that trade operations of Poland with Belarus has exceeded the numbers they had before the war. And Russian grain now is going through this channel, and Russian grain also going through Poland three times the volume of uh, Ukrainian grain, and Ukrainian grain often hits different roadblocks and blockades at the border. So I guess the honeymoon between Poland and Ukraine that was uh, unfolding at the beginning of this war is now over. And as some people were saying, just wait, life will show itself. And I think it's revealing now. And unfortunately, many countries are pulling the blanket onto themselves. And these jumps of Scholz, when he's uh, making statements, apologizing once, twice, thrice, and at the same time, the statement by the German Minister of Health, who is saying that they need to prepare their system for eventuality of a big warfare. And I'm, one can say that Russians either succeed, succeeded in injecting their threats into European media and the minds of the politicians, or indeed, and European Intel Services got enough data to analyze and say that there is a possibility that Russians will be uh, fighting in some capacity with Europe at large. And here are the two reactions, right? For me, what was interesting that Bundestag actually voted for terrorist missiles. I think, Alexei, the decision initially had Taurus mentioned in it, then they did withdraw the name of it, of that system, and just voted for the missiles with the range. Right, but they still took it, they still adopted it. And then Scholz came out and said, this is uh, going into direct conflict with Russia, and we cannot afford to do that. And for me, this is the main argument, and I did publish the prognosis for the 2024 flow of this war, and I'm saying that Russians will lead this war to the ultimatum to the second Caribbean crisis. And when people are criticizing and saying the West will not fret, the West will be fighting, will be supporting Ukraine, well, here it is. Schultz was uh, somehow threatened by, I don't know what, hybrid attack, maybe individual strike on a German base or just the general shadow of Germany fighting the war with Russia. And he is already backpedaling. What will happen when there will be a real ultimatum presented? So this war is generally symbolic. On one hand, Macron suggested to bring NATO troops into Ukraine, and uh, French uh, Figaro is publishing that uh, he is going to make this suggestion a core of his campaign, that he is uh, running this year. and. The reactions is splitting into two ways. Some countries are saying no, never. Others are saying, well, that's a good proposition. And it's an interesting material projection of the party of war actually crystallizing this year. As uh, I was talking in my prediction, I'm not saying this party has crystallized yet, but there are signs that it might. And right. In the meantime, there is Scholz there stating that, well, we're not transferring munitions that may hit Kremlin. Exactly. And uh, there was no ultimatum yet from Russia, at least publicly, nothing like that. And the West is already splitting. So generally, as a whole, it's rather weak to face and to take on the so-called axis of evil. We'll see what unfolds. So do you think if there was a message from Putin to Scholz, what could have been sent to him? Well, it could have been simple. If you engage and do this and support Ukraine in this way, we will include uh, you in the list of legit targets. I don't know, maybe a couple of warehouses will be blown up. 
And if you'll be really misbehaving, we might send a couple cruise missiles on your German bases. What then? Um, you said that you're looking at the scenario where Russia would be attacking Europe. I see three main stages for this year. First is June, voting in European Parliament. Putin wants Europe to turn right, so that there would be a lot of right-leaning parties in the European Parliament that would be forming a lot of politics to get more representation of the right, and very often they're not against uh, Russia in their statements. So then there is a NATO summit in June in Washington, and I think Russian main goal of this war is to break NATO apart or make it a complete fictitious organization, at the very least to show that NATO cannot follow through with the fifth article. And the third stage would be October, would be deep autumn, the beginning of the election campaign, or the final of election campaign in the United States, because their task is to break connections of United States and Europe that are already hanging by a thread, uh, spoke, spoken about uh, by Trump and Musk, that uh, NATO is not needed, that uh, EU should be taking care of themselves. And the end of this period would be November, when the elections are happening, and from then until inauguration of American president, whoever is elected. So at that time, they likely will be conducting some hybrid operations. We already see some things, some disturbance happening in Moldova. Moldova is not EU or NATO, but this is something for Russia to set another hotspot. And Poland and Ukraine are the neighbors of that area. And they would like to make sure that the border crisis and everything would be exacerbated between Poland and Ukraine. And also, there is a possible scenario of a Narva People's Republic, right? So called. Uh, one day, one can see a flag of Russia and over Narva, the city in Estonia, and they would be saying, well, we now want to go back to Russia, we're an independent republic. It would be a difficult proposition to take the city back by force and pacify it, where 96% are speaking Russian language. And also, if Russia brings a division or two at the border, and we'll get some artillery systems and jets flying over the head, and Russia would make, would probably could make a stance that, hey, if you go there, there will be a full war. And uh, we'll likely see the reaction of many countries in Europe, from Spain, from Portugal, from Denmark, and maybe other countries where people would be saying, why do we want to go die there? And then the fifth article would not be engaged, and that likely will be happening on the backdrop of re-elections in the United States and uh, Trump rising. And his logic is security of EU is in the hands of EU. United States will be providing global security. Main principles of naval trade will be defended with American aircraft carriers and trade principles and power. And Europe, uh, as for Europe, enough sitting on our neck and using our money when you don't want to spend 2% for your defense, go defend yourself, figure it out. And basically there will be a rhetoric coming from United States saying that NATO is a dead instrument that um, is putting United States on the verge of nuclear war with Russia because one city like Narva uh, could vote for joining Russia. And I suspect a lot of people in the West and in America will say, to heck with that, we don't want it. And then you have a crisis. And then Putin might be able to solve the historic task of breaking NATO apart in this case, if they fail. The logic of uh, Putin's uh, Russia is simple. They're weaker than NATO joint, but they're stronger than many countries that NATO is comprised of. And they could use different scenarios from purchasing, like Orban, right, when they can purchase votes and support, to scaring, like in Moldova, Georgia, and other places. And probably a combination of both. And then they can mark another victory for themselves, and I think that's what they're aspiring to achieve this year. That's why I'm thinking the year of 24 will likely become the year of a second Caribbean crisis. I don't know if the nuclear ultimatum will be posted in the open or covertly, but I think we'll see that. A small test has already happened just now, when there was a real threat for Russians that Germany will transfer Taurus missiles in under 24 hours 
Chancellor of Germany backpedaled. And now there are apologies of him coming out and he's uh, probably threatened with something, right? So do you think there is an antidote to that? What would be the right way for Europe to behave to preclude Russia from winning in this conflict? Well, Europe, Vasil, was so slow to react to this conflict, and the West at large. Uh, Putin stated the framework from the beginning. He keeps saying that he is fighting with the West. Golda Meir, the well-known leader of Israel, had said that if somebody is telling you that he wants to kill you, you should probably trust that statement, and you should be acting as if this is true. In the meantime, the West uh, doesn't react like that to Putin's statements. Putin says, we are fighting with you, and the West says, um, no, let's trade. And finally, we'll already see Prime Minister, uh, we'll see German Minister of Health saying that their health system needs to be prepared in case of a large military conflict to handle the burden. Baltic countries are already digging the trenches on the western border. Now, there are very few options for the West to react, and Macron is suggesting one of them. Let's bring Western troops to Ukraine. First of all, we'll relief a lot of Ukrainian troops that are guarding the border with Belarus and Transnistria and the other parts, because geographically Ukraine has to defend itself in a very uncomfortable conditions. We are surrounded by Russian troops on five-sixths of our border. And that tells a lot about our politics and about Russian politics. How did we find ourselves in a situation when we are encircled by on the five sixths of our territory by enemy troops? We should probably rewind one should rewind thirty years ago to start understanding that. But yeah, if uh, Macron brings any of the EU troops uh, to the north, we will have extra 200,000 to send to the front lines in the other parts, and we'll be able then to slow down Russian troops significantly, or perhaps even go to counteroffensive. Then definitely Russia will have no chances, no resources to go attack Baltic countries, or at least the probability of this goes down significantly. This is if French or other uh, troops come to defend the northern borders of Ukraine. The second is to prepare for the war directly, to pull everything in the expedited format, not do it in a commercial version, but go into the emergency situation when people are being mandated to go to the factories to produce certain numbers, when a market goes out of this equation and the countries produce to fight the war, and perhaps posting a question at uh, a higher level to United States that if they do not partake in this conflict, they likely will be losing a lot of positions in Europe in different ways. And we are in a difficult position now, and this is uh, just speaking about Europe, right? There's also Israel, there is uh, Hussid, uh, there is Taiwan, there is Latin America. So the situation is rather difficult, and the longer the West will be sleeping, then uh, so-called axis of evil with Russia at the forefront in the meantime is um, acting very urgently against the West and all the platforms, ideological, military, political, economical. And the West is just pretending that this uh, has nothing to do with it. And the longer they will be trying to evade this, the weaker they will be when the conflict arises, the physical conflict arises. I'm on the West. I see what is happening with, in the minds of people who are making decisions. I see that many of them are waking up, but not all of them. Most of them are still sleeping, and I think they're already running late. You know my prognosis, the West has already lost this war, even though it hasn't started the actual war with the West yet. Will they be able to replay that scenario? Uh, perhaps they'll need to make several significant steps, uh, like bringing their troops to Ukraine, which might bring to direct engagements with Russian troops, but will give a greater chance for Ukraine to prevail and will give enough time for Europe to prepare for the larger scale conflict. And they also have to ask themselves, are they ready for a nuclear ultimatum by Putin? And what can they counter that with? Because the main difficulty for us is that even if we get enough aid now and we fight till October when this ultimatum roughly may be presented, plus minus, it's a basic scenario, not a given, but that's generally where I think it leads to. And you have to be prepared to the worst scenario 
in politics and in medicine, right? Rescue services, reanimation brigades, they always work in that format. When they deal with life and death situations, you always have to be ready and prepared for the worst. The equipment in the reanimatology uh, vehicle needs to be prepared for saving life, not just a finger cut. So you have to ask oneself. Um, so what's, what's bad for Ukraine? The condition, if that ultimatum arises, the condition, not even a, a negotiation condition, but condition to negotiate will be for the West to drop any aid to Ukraine. And if the West will be scared by that ultimatum, they will have a very strong proclivity to give up on Ukraine. They are even now without significant threat, not really helping and sometimes wavering. Um, we will not give up and there'll be some parts of the West that will still be active in supporting us. But I suspect that uh, we will be offered to give up some of the territories that are currently occupied by Russia and uh, will be forced uh, to negotiate at the premise that will be neutral at the outcome. So this is a sad situation. When the so-called axis of evil understood that the West is weak, they started a very active attack. At the tip of this attack is Putin's Russia. Behind him there is China, India. India is to a lesser degree, but they're still on the anti-colonial, anti-West rhetoric, and they're uh, playing on both boards. Of course, there's uh, North Korea, Iran, Damascus, Syria, and that's good enough for the axis of evil to be big. And then there are a lot of neutral countries, like India, who are not really siding with one or the other, but uh, in the meantime, trading and aiding by default by their actions to that axis of evil. Um, dear friends, I'll ask you, I'll ask Alexei a few more questions about France, but uh, dear friends, could you please click the like button? We have 24,000 of you watching us live, and we are less than 4,000 like clicks so far. I cannot explain this discrepancy, so could you please Pretty please uh, press this button right now, and I will not br bring it up again. Okay, not about France, but about the nuclear ultimatum. What do you think Putin can threaten them with? Well, nuclear ultimatum is similar to Caribbean crisis too, right? Khrushchev was ready to hit United States with nukes, he just didn't have ICBMs, so he couldn't reach far. That's why he was dragging them to Cuba to be able to start the nuclear war if needed. Then both sides went to some concessions. Wise decision by Kennedy was to not give Cuba to United to Soviet Union, but to leave it under Castro. And that was in the light that the United States actually tried to take it away just before that. What is Cuba for US at those times? It was like bravari for Kievan citizens. It was an informal 53rd state of the United States. And there was a lot of investments. There, there was their party zone. And uh, if you watched uh, Godfather, the mafia is uh, deciding who's getting money from what in Cuba when he is uh, coming to Florida. So I was talking to different Cuban immigrants and Americans on this topic. This is the legend of the Paradise Lost. This is um, a very important factor. For them, back in the day, it was even more. And it was a difficult decision for Kennedy to make. It was only 100 kilometers to the United States from Cuba. And uh, he still found it within himself to make a wise decision. I think they will make a wise decision much easier, which is not 100 kilometers, but much further. The ultimatum could be simple. Russia could hit Snake Island with tactical nuke, and then they could possibly hit the crossing between Poland and Ukraine. And then maybe Zeshov, the, ba the NATO base where the cargo NATO planes are landing. And then, and then the escalation might be the open nuclear war, right? And as they said in Russia for over several years, oh, we will go to heaven and you guys will go guess where. And the whole world will be radioactive dust. Real words from Russian uh, Russian TV shows, Russian analytics and propagandists. So, what will Europe do, and what can they do to stop Russia in this case? Um, in my view, only the highest rising of the stakes. But I am also seeing that if you bring this proposition now to all the population of the Europe and states, that all your tournaments, all your computer games, all your coffee shops, all your quality of life all your uh, joys that you have will be burnt in radioactive fire because you 
want to protect that one city in Estonia or Ukraine, they'll probably say, take the whole Ukraine and be gone with it. Well, the problem is that expert society is not really, and West at large, don't realize that Putin will not stop at that, that he will continue. West uh, expert society is waking up a bit. There is a larger big group now that understands the real nature of Putin. But, uh, and there is a chance that maybe more will get awoken and um, the balance will change. But for now, it is still not favorable. So, in your feelings, how serious is Macron with his proposition? And if his initiative will be supported in France, when do you think it might happen and in what quantities? Well, look, Vassil, France is a very special country. First of all, they are one of the few countries, one of the five or six countries in the world who produce everything from machine guns to nukes on their own. Second is the peculiarity of leadership capability in France. In France, the president has the full capacity to engage any enemy with uh, French forces. He has super rights to engage and to make a decision. Neither in Russia nor in the United States, the president can do it on his own. Even in Russia, Putin had to get a formal OK from the council. And France, a president can just sign a decree and send his troops where he wants to. So in this regard, France has managed way better than many other countries. So he may make a decision that, hey, guys, in such a capacity that many divisions go to protect the Ukraine borders. And they're viewing different options. They're viewing uh, special forces, air defense systems. Uh, there are different options possible. Canada is joining them and discussing with them. Estonia is also on the bandwagon. And first, it would be a great aid to Ukraine and a big step towards escalation in Europe. And because Russians already said that if any other European troops appear in Ukraine, they'll become a legitimate target and they'll be attacked. Well, OK, in this case, it means uh, military engagement between EU countries and Russia. Macron did surprise me. He is meeting with more leaders. And if he is ready to pull the blanket so far, then the question is probably when and how all of a sudden he grew such large testicular organs. And perhaps uh, because in France there is a very big right-wing lobby of retired generals and uh, military industry, the rather serious lobby and institute in France. And during the last couple of years, they already turned to the president a couple of times that they may take power in their hands if the abandonment of French interests will continue at the current pace. And this all happened during times when there were a lot of protests in France, when they were losing on the global arena. Um, so France is rather decisive, and despite some people thinking that they are cowards and not eager to fight, they are serious war fighters. They actually like that, and they have proven to be successful on many occasions. They have uh, the biggest army in Europe, not counting Ukrainian, 225,000 active troops and also nukes. So France has serious arguments. They could become a leader of such a coalition. Brits also discussing this probability, and um, they are they're somewhat split. Some of them support it, others not, but unfortunately they have nothing to bring to the front. They only have 75,000 of ground troops and, what, 20 tanks. But they do have aviation, which is uh, of note. So we'll see where it goes. The most interesting is what pushed that, what uh, led to this statement. It's, I think, either a strategic disinformation from Russia that they will invade Europe and they are now reacting, which from the point of view might reveal the weakness because they might support that first, but unless they actually do follow through with bringing troops. Or they actually saw some good plans by their intel, which uh, uncovered Russian plans to attack and to escalate. And now they're reacting to it in the way they find feasible. Anyway, for now, this is just on the political level. We'll see what ensues in the material world. But again, if they don't want to give up on Ukraine, then in a situation when the United States are not providing arms and shells and uh, any support, which is now, um, the only way to support Ukraine is to bring their own troops. So if they don't have troops to give to, uh, to if they don't have equipment to give to Ukraine, they can at least bring their own troops uh, well equipped. So who do you think can support Macron? Well, it's not so much who can support him, but who can actually materially support him, who have enough troops to come and present a serious factor on the front. Germans definitely know. They have only, what, six brigades? 
Baltic countries, with all due respect, um, also know they don't have enough to protect themselves. Um, probably Brits, French uh, troops, uh, Canada perhaps. They don't have enough numbers in the West, that's the problem. Whatever they're talking about, a small professional army, this is all good in the peaceful days when your only foe is maybe some partisans somewhere. But when you talk about a big-scale war, it's always quantity that wins over quality, especially if the quality is small and expensive. Because a small and very professional army may start the conflict fine and may hit a lot of targets successfully, but the quantity will still prevail. And small armies, small professional armies have very expensive equipment, which is usually enough for one good operation, but definitely not enough for 20 or 30 repetitions of that. And military industry is also not geared for large-scale production. So this statement is somewhat specific. What I think they aim at is that even if there'll be a smaller number of French or Western troops brought to Ukraine, that Russia will avoid hitting them. But we saw the smirk of Lavrov when he was asked about that, Russian foreign minister. I don't think there will be that'll stop them because they might try as a test to hit something with these troops first and then see the reaction, and then they will probably attack at large. So to change the situation seriously, you need to bring probably half an army of French uh, troops, right, of France here, or troops of the United States. But the question is, the better option is to support Ukrainian troops with means to fight, because we already proved that we can stop Russian troops. We can destroy them, we can counterattack, if we are well armed. So the central question in the whole story is transfer to Ukrainian armed forces enough military equipment. And then the question of bringing other armies to the front is question number two. And these propositions only appear in the backdrop of uh, United States not supporting Ukraine with military aid. So, on one hand, it's good that they're not really giving up on us. On the other hand, there is a other calculation, right? Europe is thinking that what if Russians will be scared to attack? Maybe that will be one scenario, but if they won't, what next? All right, Alexei, so if Russians are not afraid to attack, imagine that, if they still hit the French troops on the border, what will happen? Well, then non-army will just stand there and wait while their soldiers are being killed. So they'll get engaged, they'll fight the war, and um, then you have the war of French and Ukrainian lines against Russian and Belarus alliance. And it only sounds like madness, but, you know, a few years ago, the war with uh, active hot war between Russia and Ukraine, some people were saying is mad. A question from viewers. We're getting to this uh, segment of the show. Please add more in our commentary. I'll start with the ones that were posted early on. Alexei Nikolaevich, do you think the do you think citizens of Dnieper need to be concerned and start figuring ways out to get of the city, or do you think Russia is not capable of hitting that city yet? No, for Dnieper it's a bit too early. Yes, indeed, Russia has five or six groups of forty or fifty thousand that are conducting operative tactical level activities in different parts of the front. The nearest to Dnieper is Rabotina, uh, Zaporozhye, and Avdiivka direction. But again, both of them are pretty far. And that's why the question is, if we will be holding the front and we'll have enough resources to hold the front, there's nothing to worry about. But if the scenario transpires where we have nothing to hold the front with, then it will not only be Dnieper uh, fleeing, there'll be other cities in Kiev will probably start evacuating, and then we might be lucky to hold the line along the Dnieper River. So it's too early to worry about that, in my opinion. When it will be time, I will make sure to let know. We'll come out in an emergent stream and I'll let know that it's time to go. Okay, another question. Earlier in streams, Aristovich often presented brief political reviews. Who, with whom, against whom? Could you please dedicate some effort to that? China, United States, UK, where is the place of Ukraine in the global geopolitics? Who are our friends and who is not? 
Well, I think, Vasil, I was just giving that for the half an hour, for the first half an hour of this show, because scenario of um, bringing Western troops to Ukraine is a good uh, piece of news to go over that question, exactly, because there is an axis of evil, as it was claimed, and it actually is rather coordinated, and the axis of uh, light, the axis of good, has not formed. We are sort of on the axis of uh, good, on the axis of light at this point, but um, I don't think this group opposing the axis of evil is quite formed yet, because in America there is a serious conflict between the Congress and the President, and there is no aid coming, even though they both sides know that it costs our lives. End of part one.